Hi everyone. Well, two minutes ago I thought I was going to speak alone. <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming. So my name is Norbert. Uh, I'm doing protocol research at Gevulot. And uh, there was a slight change in the title. Um, I'm going to talk about the mechanism design of, the, of a prover network. But actually that prover network is a decentralized cloud specifically optimized for ZK. We call it ZK Cloud. That's going to be the end product, the permissionless decentralized product. And uh, yeah, um, so that's kind of how the initial title transitioned to this um, kickoff slide here. Um, OK, let's start off. Um, before I go into details, I would like to talk a little bit about why decentralization matters. Um, <clears throat> the proving market is uh, quite susceptible to centralization, and that is because it involves, like, it's heavy on economics. For example, also, if we look at uh, the MEV market, or like block building on Ethereum, you see that it involves uh, a lot of money, you know, heavy on economics, and because of that, it's actually a couple of um, uh, specialized builders who are building most of the blocks on Ethereum. Similar way, we expect that the proving market can be equally centralized, if not more. Um, and because of that, it's super important to talk about decentralization, to design protocols that consider these type of uh, centralization risks. Because centralization in itself is not just you know, an issue because there is one entity or a, a limited number of entities producing proofs. It's an issue because it increases the risks of liveness. It increases the risk of like unhealthy cost structures or like centralized entities becoming like dominant in defining cost structures. Um, it increases the, li uh, the, the risk of censorship, for example, or it may also have some scalability issues or uh, land in some scalability issues. So uh, the solution is from our perspective, and that's how uh, um, we started building Gevulot is we need to rely on mechanism design principles that can address these risks um, and that can address um, these concerns. One of the key decision points I want to talk about more is the workload allocation mechanism. And the reason why this is important is because you can build a decentralized network. It can be per like you can allow permissionless entry for anyone. Uh, anyone can spin up a prover node and join the network. But if at the end of the day your workload allocation mechanism is such that it can be easily, um, like it's, it's very susceptible to centralization, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, then you may end up losing out or like spoiling all the advantages that the permissionless entry or like the trustless execution would bring. And let's, let's go into more details what, I'm, what, I, what I mean by this. So a couple of design considerations uh, when we talk about workload allocation. I'm just listing here a couple of the most popular or known ones maybe. Auctions, let's start off with auctions. So auctions are a good tool to decrease costs. Uh, on the other hand, I don't believe auctions are the holy grail, and I'll talk about that uh, later on as well. On the one hand, it is because in, in an auction, basically the market will start forming the cost structures and like the, uh, how, uh, like how at the end of the day, how much the, the proving will cost. On the other hand, if um, protocol economy, like proper economics are designed at protocol level around the cost of proving, you don't necessarily need an auction. In simple words, if you can make proving cheap enough within your protocol, you don't need to, to uh, apply an auction to bring it even further down. And I'll, I'll, we'll get there. My main issue with auctions is that any rich entity, super rich entity, let's say one of the big names, Amazon, Google, whoever, if they would like to come and become dominant uh, in the ZK proving space, maybe they could afford underbidding everyone for years, even doing proofs at loss, until the whole competition is killed. The decentralized permissionless network I built is basically down uh, to a couple of huge entities winning all the rights to prove uh, the jobs or like to complete the jobs. And then 
even if my intention was, was to build a decentralized network, my workload allocation mechanism allowed it to be kind of, you know, the, the advantages of that to be spoiled. So prover undercutting is real. Uh, it's happening on, uh, like it's been happening on Mina's Snarket place, for example. It's a little different story. I don't want to go into details, but like entities started offering proofs for free on the marketplace, which killed the whole economics and, you know, it's, uh, it's um, unhealthy dynamics. Order book based mechanisms are such that also richest entities could absorb the demand at any cost if they can afford to absorb that demand and again create healthy, unhealthy economic dynamics. Proof racing is something uh, I think it's also important to talk about. We've seen um, like proof of work type of mining. The most powerful entities can easily create uh, or become dominant there as well. And again, someone has to pay for redundancy, so it's never going to be the cheapest option, obviously. Um, State-based lottery, that's a more interesting, already a um, more interesting thing. Lottery hints at some more neutral solution uh, to, to allocate workloads. You know, it kind of includes randomness. On the other hand, um, since it's stake-based, again, the richest entities will have proportionately higher shares, like higher chances of being selected by that lottery. So it, again, somewhat limits um, the, the decentralized network that one might want to build if it's paired up with this type of uh, workload allocation mechanism. And then we've got randomness at the end of the list. Um, that's, as of now, um, I believe that's the most neutral and fair workload allocation. Um, obviously, you cannot prevent a large entity to spin up thousands of nodes in your network and thus increase the chances of them being selected for the jobs even in a random network. But that's just the property of permissionless decentralized blockchains. So it's not like something you can, uh, you can um, uh, avoid. On the other hand, for them to do that, it may just include a whole much more um, capital to, to somehow tweak um, the network to their favor. So that carries the least risk of centralization, uh, a, a pure random selection, and that's what we uh, also voted for at our end. Uh, please. But wouldn't that the, the last option be kind of equivalent? No, because randomness doesn't take into consideration the amount of stake you have. Uh, but in, in a way, if you have money, you can buy more stake. Uh, equally, if you have more money, you can spin up and put more capital. Yeah, uh, actually, that's a good point. It, they are somewhat similar in that sense. We would need to do a bit more research on what, which one would cost more. Uh, it depends on stake size, and it could, it, it could even depend on, for example, whether I could imagine delegated staking also being involved, kind of like involving uh, retail in running prover nodes and then, you know, delegating stake on behalf of the provers, something like that. So it's not the actual prover who would, uh, yeah, so there could be some different aspects there. But yeah, that's a good, that's a valid point that needs to be uh, researched a bit more. Yeah, Please. Okay. So with decentralization, it's obviously kind of, as he hinted, it's hard to get pure de uh, true decentralization. So do you guys break that down into properties that you want? Because for example, mm -hmm. you could have a healthy network where there's just one or two parties, and if they ever go down, someone comes in, but then perhaps it's bad if those go down and no one comes in, so that's yeah. like- I'm gonna talk about that, yeah. There are properties, uh, like much broader properties built around decentralization. I just wanted to start off with this one. So basically, uh, I just wanted to go through the previous slide because it's worth for all of us to be aware of these risks and whenever we make decisions on where to outsource proving because it seems the industry, like that's the main, uh, the industry is leaning, leaning towards outsourced proof generation and when projects or we make decisions on where to do that, it's good to be aware of uh, different trade-offs that we may come across uh, when we select certain uh, proof providers. So the core principles that we've been following, they are decentralization focused, and they are like these decisions ensure that no one can control 
uh, where proving happens. Um, it can offer, like with these decisions and protocol level principles, we can increase liveness guarantees, we can in increase censorship resistance, um, add trustless properties, reach a fair distribution or a fairer di distribution of workloads and rewards, and like all this adds up to a more credibly neutral type of network that can serve the industry well. Uh, I do believe that uh, proving should be fast, cheap, and decentralized, and that's kind of the core vi vision with which we've been building the ZK Cloud uh, at Gavulot. Um, yeah, so why decentralized cloud? Basically, as mentioned, the industry is leaning towards third-party proof generation, but most of the proof providers currently are actually using AWS or GCP. Um, and we've talked about the risks that uh, centralized entities may mean. I don't want to go into details of that again, but um, with the ZK Cloud, basically we are distributing proving workloads across a permissionless global network of prover nodes. Um, we apply an underlying blockchain um, to make that workload allocation and reward distribution um, fair and balanced. And also we needed an underlying blockchain because this is how we are able to uh, design economics flexibly. So the main goal of Gavulot, one of the key design goals of Gavulot was how can we make proving orders at least an order of magnitude cheaper than what it is now. And uh, for that we, we had to turn away from any existing like building on Ethereum, building on an L2, building on Solana, whatever, because then we would have inherited the economic structures of the underlying network. So it's a Cosmos-based chain, uh, nothing fancy. Um, it's very minimal. We have no smart contract state, uh, basically very minimal re-execution, limited number of operations. It's purely uh, optimized for um, processing proofs uh, and generating uh, generating proofs and processing proof requests. So we're on a very high level, we are aggregating proof demand and thus reaching a higher hardware utilization for, uh, for our node network. Um, it's scalable because it can accommodate, like it can horizontally scale without the economics being basically affected. And um, we have protocol level um, execution guarantees, fallback mechanisms uh, to ensure liveness, uh, censorship resistance, etc. Um, it's a basically what is okay as we get closer to what is ZK Cloud. So it's basically a decentralized proving and compute layer that is fast, cheap, uh, and yeah, I already mentioned decentralized. It's fast because we have. Um, high performance compute nodes optimized for ZK and we add on top of this node and network level orchestration um, to optimize performance. And also, as I already mentioned, we aggregate workloads from all across the industry. I'm going to talk a little bit more on the details of this, how we actually, like what it boils down to at the end of the day. But with this, we are able to reduce costs um, for all participants, basically. And it's decentralized because we have permissionless entry for uh, both of both types of our nodes, both the validator and the prover nodes uh, in the network. So that's going to be in the ZK Cloud. The architecture has three main layers, a universal proving layer, an orchestration layer, and then a, a decentralized compute layer. For the proving layer, let's start with that. So it's, why is it universal? It's universal because it supports any proof system. So we don't have our own product, ZKVM, ZKEVM, whatever. We don't write our own circuits. We don't have our own proof system. Uh, we have no preference for DSL. Anything that can be basically compiled into an F binary could be run on Gavulot. Um, because of this, we are basically able to support any prover out there even any prover network that exists or prover marketplace or directly any project with ZKP demand. Um, and the integration is flexible. Like we are pre-deploying a bunch of the big names. Uh, I'll, I'll share a slide on that. So you can, um, as a user, uh, people can use the pre-deployed programs on, on the network. 
but you can also deploy your own. So it's kind of like bring your own prover binary. If you want to take an existing prover, make your own optimizations, and you want a platform where you can deploy it and then get proofs cheap, fast, in a decentralized uh, way, then, then uh, the ZK Cloud is very well fit for that. Please. Yeah, um, so do you, does the blockchain verify the proofs? Yes. Um, I'm going to talk about that, but actually it's a good question, so we can discuss that here as well. I don't need to be like, super strict on the, <laughs> on the content and don't want to be. So we do verification internally anyway, because uh, that's how we know the provers did the job properly, and based on that can we only pay the rewards to our provers. So when you deploy a prover program on Kevlar, you need to deploy the corresponding verifier program as well. So we use, when you send a proof request to your own program, for example, referencing the hash of your prover program um, with the input, etc., the proof is generated, you can already fetch the proof and have it settled wherever you wish to if you don't want to accept our verification because probably like Ethereum would have a much higher economic security behind that. But if you, um, if you want, like if the verification or the security level for the verification on Gavulot is sufficient for you, you can wait for us to do the verification as well, fetch the result and then uh, you get a verified proof. We need that, as I mentioned. That, so we are going to do that anyway, uh, because that's how we yeah, pay I, I the rewards. Yeah, I guess the angle I'm curious about is the execution angle. So basically, the nodes in the blockchain have to run arbitrary binaries? Basically, yes. Okay. Yes. And I'll go into details like who is doing verification, who is doing proving, how do we select these nodes for the different tasks, okay. etc. Regarding orchestration, as mentioned, it's a, it's a blockchain-based mechanism managing workload distribution, uh, reward distribution. We've got uh, orchestration within the nodes uh, to optimize hardware utilization, etc., but among nodes, like within the network as well. Um, this way, it's not just hardware utilization or increased hardware utilization, but at the end of the day, paired up with the aggregation from the industry and like being able to process kind of any proof request for any proof system, it brings actually just higher revenue for our prover nodes as well, How much higher revenue potential which with much simpler maintenance because they don't need to maintain 10 different prover nodes in 10 different networks, but they simply maintain one node in Gabulot that may just, uh, where the network aggregates the workloads. And um, yeah, we've got built-in execution guarantees. I'm going to talk about that later on as well. And then, as I mentioned, we have a compute layer at the bottom, permissionless entry for GPU nodes, CPU nodes, and also custom hardware. Um, the Fabric team uh, is also here. They are building this general purpose um, processing unit. Seems to be very interesting. So we want to allow easy integration of those exotic hardware as well in the network. And all of this is optimized for um, ZK Compute. So we've got, I think I mentioned the dual node architecture. So validators and provers, um, validators are randomly selected, uh, like the leader is randomly selected for every block. Uh, it orders transactions into blocks, etc. It's the usual thing that validators do. They form consensus. There are the normal incentives, I, I don't think. Um, I wouldn't go into more details regarding that. However, um, a little more details on, on block content maybe. I already mentioned that programs come in two varieties, so you deploy prover programs and the corresponding verifier as well. Um, we do have plans later on to do verification solely uh, if there is demand for that. In that case, the proof would be generated elsewhere and we just do the verification. But initially, we'll start off with proving and verification together. The blocks on Gavulot will include basically deployment transactions, prover program deployment transactions, uh, proving results, verification results, and as I mentioned, it's a minimal blockchain, no smart contract state, barely any re-execution there. And regarding the prover nodes, that's more interesting, I think. So when prover nodes join the network, we do an initial pretty heavy capacity verification. 
So we don't want self-reporting, we don't want to fetch their hardware data. Um, we give them test workloads, which they need to complete within some time constraint. And if they are able to do that, they will be sufficiently large that we will know they do have the proper hardware uh, to be able to serve our users and customers. And it's not just initial capacity verification, but we are going to verify their constant availability and capability of generating proofs uh, through like random regular allocation of these types of test tasks as well. Um, so a random prover is selected for every workload. The randomness will be calculated using the previous blocks hash. We're going to have a one second block time approximately or even a bit lower uh, optimally than that. So basically, it's not really pre-calculable per se. Um, and then a subset of prover nodes. Sorry. Okay. And then a subset of prover nodes is selected to do the verification. So the prover nodes are doing the proving and the verification as well. Obviously, you cannot be selected or you won't be selected to verify your own proof. But uh, there is one node generating the proof and a subset of the of the prover set that is going to do the verification. You can add redundancy because we do have a fallback mechanism. So it means you send a request, we allocate it to a prover node, the node fails. Based on the fallback mechanisms, it will be a uh, fallback mechanism, it will be right away reallocated. So we want to make sure you don't need to restart an auction or make, take any action from your angle or from your side. Uh, but we want, to, uh, we want that to be baked into the protocol. But if you don't want to run the risk of having to wait double the time, if the first prover fails, doesn't deliver the proof, and then you need to wait again, yeah, one quick thing, you get 50% of your fees back if you need to wait another time. So we, we, we do acknowledge that it's, it's a disadvantage to the user, so we, we give back a large portion of the fees for in case that would happen. But uh, if you don't want to wait or run this risk, you can increase redundancy and have two, three nodes working initially on your request. That is going to have a bit higher costs, but it shouldn't be that big of an impact. We'll see the cost structure soon. Um, yeah, please. Sorry, you, you mentioned that they didn't want to go into many details about the, the consensus and the yeah. uh, like the validator, right? Yeah. I, I'm not that familiar with, with the Cosmos, I guess. Uh, but uh, so that if, if uh, depending on the security assumption, right, the consensus, if it's a, a state base or whatever, right? Uh, wouldn't uh, a leader be able to sort of affect the outcome of the randomness coming from the hash of the block that is uh, proposing in a way? By reordering, you know, censoring uh, some uh, transaction or proof so that you can control a little bit of what is going to be the next uh, random. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Honestly, I haven't really thought about that, but... You uh, um, will now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, by the way, he's our integration and integrations engineer, Brian, so he may feel free to chime in if, you're, if you've got some information on those. No, that's something we, we will be... Uh, I'll need to think through, and we'll consider that when we are uh, designing that. I like, also just did your... Yeah. I don't know how yeah, it's a... On the, like, it's a normal Comet BFT based consensus. The way it works is that, uh, in general, in Cosmos, uh, and I, yeah, I, I, that's just high level, uh, it's a stake based randomness. So the amount of stake, self stake and delegated stake to the yeah. validators will define their chances of, of being selected to, as a leader. We do want to move away from that okay. and remove the, the stake-based uh, connection just to make it random, but we'll consider that. Thanks a lot for the, for the input and for the, uh, for the question, because it's useful and we'll need to think about that. Coming back to the provers, so we are designing so-called custom prover sets as well, where you could create small subsets of provers if you have some specific need. For example, if you want to plug in custom hardware, not all of our provers would have that. 
So this custom prover set, in that case, the random selection would run among the nodes who have the proper hardware. Or if you have some external software dependencies, then in this custom prover set, the prover nodes would need to run that external software as well to be able to generate the proof for you. And also, uh, if like to facilitate easy uh, working with data storage or availability solutions, uh, like custom prover sets will enable us to give a whole bunch of flexibility uh, around that to the users. A quick roadmap, and then we are going to more practical details. So we've had the DevNet up and running since March uh, this year. It's been generating about 2.1, 2.2 million proofs since March. Uh, it's been steady. It has the full proving pipeline, deploying prover programs, generating proofs, verifying them. It's real proofs for free. Currently, it's even at this moment, it's running. It's free of charge for anyone. Um, it's permissioned because uh, we have a set of node operators who were running or who are running those nodes. But, uh, and it doesn't have the economics and the consensus yet. However, the core element of the entire proving pipeline is already there and it's been, it's been running stable. We are launching Firestarter in a couple of days' time. It's a scalable production-grade network. It's permissioned because we run all the validators but we are already onboarding prover nodes into the network. So the, proving node, the prover node side is already distributed, decentralized, but we run all the validators, so it's still permissioned. We are going to have an incentivized permissionless testnet in Q4 and probably late Q4, early uh, next year Q1, we are going to have the fully permissionless decentralized ZK Cloud running. Um, yeah, actually, I mentioned the stats. Maybe it's something worth mentioning. People have been uh, uh, deploying about 390 prover programs on the network. Some of these may be the same program, but as they were working on optimizing things, redeploying them, and starting benchmarking on that as well. I think about 150 of those are <laughs> Some of them are. Some of them are, uh, like, we have a couple of them pre-deployed. The Polygon ZK VM, uh, we are working on the scroll, scroll prover. We've got ZK Sync, Risk Zero, ZK VM, SP1, Nexus, um, STX Beratenberg library is already there. So we've got a couple of, a couple of those big names pre-deployed. But I've also been in touch with teams that uh, wanted a platform where they can deploy different programs and then start benchmarking because the underlying hardware is similar. And uh, yeah. I have a super curious. Uh, no, go uh, go for it. No, I'm, I'm happy for the questions. Be for, for yourself, but I would love uh, maybe not really this workshop about it. Uh, uh, know whether you you have some you know less software uh, during this. Uh, uh, Sure yeah, so actually, I think it's going to be the next oh, yeah. slide or something like that. Very valid question. Yeah, key learnings All from right. the demo. <laughs> Don't Very. Thomas right here. <laughs> yeah, the main thing is uh, like two core things. Production workloads will require execution guarantees and fallback mechanisms. So that's not something any prover network can, can spare. And, you know, like, if there is an L2, obviously currently L2s are, are the biggest demand uh, drivers for, for ZK. So in that sense, a sequencer cannot afford not receiving a proof. So we do, have, we do need those guarantees and fallbacks. And again, significant compute resources are needed for production grade or like for production workloads, be it a Polygon ZK VM, be it um, scroll, stack, whichever we talk about. So you need efficient workload orchestration there. That's something we are also focusing on. And then again, we had Nanos VM, so the prover programs, uh, the OS images were run uh, in Nanos VMs in our DevNet. We are moving away from Unikernels and Nanos, going with containers and Linux VM. <laughs> yeah, so that's... So that's something. So we are we are moving from from Nanos to Linux VM, and we are moving away from OS images to containers to make sure that developers have a much smoother experience. Because again, that's something that turned out to be uh, like 
super like anyway super important. Is this side of the job fascinating? Yeah, it is what it is. Uh, yes, so let, I want to talk a little bit about what's coming with Firestarter. So. Firestarter is the end-to-end -end implementation of ZK Cloud. So when I'm talking about Firestarter, take it as like, it's the ZK Cloud, but we run it in a permissioned fashion currently. So we call it uh, Firestarter. It's gonna have decentralized cloud infrastructure underneath, optimized for CPU and GPU workloads. It can scale to thousands of prover nodes if need be. Um, and it's compatible, as I mentioned already, with any prover program. So you can deploy any arbitrary program you, you want or you use, or you can use the pre-deployed ones we have. Yeah, I think I missed Starkware, Linear uh, there. I think I mentioned the, the others. Please. Yeah, I'm just fascinated with arbitrary binary execution. So <laughs> like, I, I'm yeah. just thinking about the scenario where I deploy a program and I want to cause other provers to look flaky, so it's sort of programmed that at some point I'm the only one who could actually execute the proofs, and um, yeah, I, I guess, like, do you think that's fine? Do you think the incentives are kind of fine there? Or? No, I, I understand. I understand your point. So when you start, so the, th the thing is, okay, from a practical perspective, that's a, that's a valid, very valid question, by the way. Yeah. From a practical perspective, you could do that. But you deploy your program. When you start sending proofs to your program, it's going to cost you money, obviously. You may earn with your prover node, but it's going to cost you money. But why would any of us in this room would want to, like, we would not know about your program being deployed or like your hash ID. Basically, except for you, probably no one really would start sending requests to that. And if you want to spoil that, it will cost you money as well. I mean, obviously, also it will cost you from the other side. So you run your own prover node, which will have incur costs in itself, then you will incur costs by sending a bunch of requests. So at the end of the day, I'm not sure if it would be worth or like how, how realistic or like how impactful uh, such an attack sense, would be? Um, I guess there's two sides of the coin. If ah. you, like, well, just one what you said, if you are putting a binary and it's like, okay, it's kind of a little malicious, you know, eventually I can just turn off, like, uh, make people see like flaky, then, um, okay, fine, they just don't opt in. But if they don't opt in, then how do I bootstrap a new prover program? You know, I have just a small network, I want my prover program in your cloud. How would you have to just convince provers to whitelist it? I mean, all the provers in the global prover set, all of our provers will be able to accept proofs for any program in the network. Mm -hmm. So you can, with a custom prover set, you could, you have the option to limit whoever like whichever provers are included in the in the in the set or in, in the prover set and thus included in the random selection, but in ge in general, all provers will be doing proving for all workloads in the network. So, right. So that's where I, I kind yeah. Of get so there is no opt-in in general. Yeah. So in, in general, you can make a program seems fine for a while, and maybe some people are tricked by using it, and then you turn on the fact that you're now the only prover. Maybe calls up to the network and. Oh, it just uh, jumps. You can't. Yeah. You can't call them. Okay. So, so your idea is, is awesome. I would love to see someone try that. Um, but the way these things are run, they're run in isolated VMs with no network access. So you would have a real hard telling that you're on your prover node. Well, like, you, you, that would be. It's kind I of think it could, it could yeah. have a back doorway it's, where I have a private key, and then after a certain clock time, it's malicious. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not impossible, obviously. I mean, nothing's impossible, but it's. it's it would be incredibly difficult to pull that off. Interview. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with the answer. It yeah. just doesn't seem perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's really good to is, is no, the, 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 the fact that you probably wouldn't make a lot of money off of doing that, <laughs> and the yeah. amount of effort you have to put into doing it at all, it, it, it's just probably not likely. Although, yeah. please. <laughs> no, but the, the, these things are very important for us as well, because we'll, we'll consider it when designing further and fine-tuning further the network. Um, but there is no baiting, basically, in, uh, into the type of uh, uh, provers 
that one can uh, register to ZK Club, right? So it's completely open and permissionless yeah. in that sense. Okay. Yes. Uh, a quick comparison from between the DevNet and Firestarter. Uh, yeah, the main difference is it's scalable. Uh, we are already onboarding nodes, prover nodes. Uh, it's got random selection. It's incentivized. If you want to run prover nodes on Gabulot, uh, it's an in incentivized network. Uh, we've got fallback mechanisms, the consensus in place. It's ready for production use cases, even to serve like the largest workloads currently out there. Maybe, I don't know, proving Ethereum blocks would be one of the largest, uh, largest jobs out there, but uh, with proper orchestration and like hundreds of nodes in the network, uh, it can be pulled off easily. We are going to have a free tier on Firestarter as well and different payment options, but I think it's becoming quite interesting now. So ZK Cloud and as a permission version of ZK Cloud Firestarter, it's, we feel it's really changing the game in terms of and removing one of the biggest bottlenecks uh, in ZK adoption, kind of, and that is cost. This is a summary of what we've been talking about. I don't think I'd, I'd point out any particular um, parts of this. Rather, keep on heading towards the actual cost structures. So, a couple of things to summarize. Firestarter, we use containers that run on Linux VMs. Um, no need for developers to learn new tools, etc., etc. It's highly scalable, even to thousands of nodes if there is sufficient uh, demand. And it's very ideal, as I mentioned, for parallel workloads. For example, risk zero's segmentation and like processing several segment proofs and then the aggregation tree built on top that can be easily uh, orchestrated on the network or that will be efficiently orchestrated in the network. Also, Aztec's proof tree, where each client-side transaction uh, lands with the client-side proofs, and then that is turned into a honk proof on the server side already, then the public circuits are executed over that, and then the aggregation tree starts, basically. We've been participating in the, in the Aztec contest a month ago or so. Actually, <clears throat> we won the custom integration category. We tied in the number of proven blocks with three other teams because all four of us were able to prove every single block, but we had the uh, lowest average proving time, so we won in terms of proving speed in that category as well. Anyway, so that's we've got quite some experience and on how to. Anybody could actually. Yeah, anybody could come in and. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. because the sequencer was, was pushing right. the, the, the block content right. basically right. to any participant who yes. was. Please. Yeah, I was curious. As a prover, how do I, if you're just running a single binary, how do I horizontally scale? Like, if I get like a risk zero segment proving, like, how do I horizontally scale that work? Or is the network managing that tree? The network is managing that tree in a sense that. The data transit costs. It's going to be, maybe you, so can, you have more, like, we are going to have something that we call workflows where you can define complex complex task structures, mm -hmm. so to say. And like in risk zero, there is an executor who breaks down any proving job into segments, but they don't need to wait until the end. So the, the proofs can already be started for the initial segments. And then, but you need the segments for, for, to complete the aggregation. Um, so that's something that we um, will like we bake into the network to do that type of orchestration so that it can be like workloads can be or tasks within workloads can be spread across multiple uh, nodes and then and then aggregated. Uh, for example, for Aztec, we've been using forty prover agents, which means that it was basically forty entities proving. Uh, like one transaction per entity because the tube circuit to convert the the client side proof to a home proof that's the heaviest it takes like four minutes based on Aztec benchmarks as of now so you need four minutes for every single client transaction uh, and that's just the first circuit to be run on the client side proofs so yeah, we were running like 40 proving agents uh, to, to the, complete that. What is the network land requirements then? 
Pardon? What is like the WAN IO? Like, what is your gig? Do you know that like uh, one minimum uh, 10, one, yeah, one 10 gigabit is optimum? Minimum 10 is highly recommended. Okay, cool. Yeah. Makes sense for DC. Okay. And any decent data center should have a little more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't really highlight anything. I already mentioned credits here. You need to buy credits to be able to start proving on Gavulot, like on Firestarter. One credit is one USD. Uh, yeah, I started talking about that. Let me, let me uh, go to this slide and then I'll go back to the actual life cycle of approving workloads. So a little bit about the pricing of Firestarter. It's a pay-as-you-go pricing model, so you pay for the resources you use and for the time you use it. Uh, as I mentioned, one credit is one USD. <clears throat> Our, as a general um, like summary, our GPU nodes are going to have two 4090s each, 64 cores, and 380 gigs of RAM. So that's one GPU node. A CPU node will have uh, 96 cores and 768 gigs of RAM. That's the minimum requirement for folks to join the network as a CPU or a GPU node. The cost per hour on the GPU node, if you want to use the full capacity of that node, is 84 cents per hour. That translates to 600 bucks a month. You get 24 7 full capacity, 240 90s, 64 cores, 380 gigs of RAM for 600 bucks a month if you ever wanted to use it constantly. Obviously, with the random selection and the orchestration, it's not going to land at one single node. It's just an expressive number uh, that shows like the total cost of like what this hourly cost translates to per month. For a CPU node, it's 440 bucks a month, uh, but it's actually 61 cents per hour if you want to use the full capacity. Now, when you submit a proof request to Gavulot, to Firestarter, as I mentioned, you reference the hash ID of the prover program and the verifier program that you want your inputs to be executed on. Then you set the parameters for resource allocation. How many CPU cores you want to work on your request, how much RAM you want to be allocated, how many GPUs, because the GPU nodes will have two each, so you can select one or, or you want both to work on it. And then you define the running time. Um, because you would know, like we would expect users to know the prover program and the execution time, the approximate execution time with the resource allocation that they have chosen. Actually, we would expect users also to kind of do benchmarking when they start using the network, you know, based on their, their actual priorities. Do they want to prioritize for speed, allocate more resources, pay a little more? It's still going to be cheap, but pay a little more or they want to uh, add lower resources and pay even less um, because, let's say, proving time is not, is not a priority. So yeah, these are the parameters. The running time is considered with, with like one CPU or one CPU. How do you measure the running time? Running time is just minutes. Like, how, how long should our prover nodes run the prover program with your inputs? So if you allocate, let's, let's take this example here. If you allocate if you want 32 cores, 190 gigs of RAM, and one GPU to be allocated on your, uh, to your request, and you expect that with this resource allocation, in five minutes your proof should be done, then that's what you would pay, like yeah, 3.5 cents, basically. Like, how do I know that it will be enough five minutes? Let's say that I have a laptop uh, and I, my laptop is not that powerful. No, I mean, I, I think you would start sending a couple of test requests oh, to the network. Okay. Like, if, if this workload costs three cents, then in, in a dollar or two you would be able, or in ten bucks, like, with, with a couple of dollars you would be able to do a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of test workloads to see, okay, if I set this amount of uh, hardware to be allocated to my job, then what's the optimal uh, proving time, okay, okay. something like that. Some yeah, and as soon as we have some retroactive data as well, because we will have some data, you know, how long it takes uh, to run a workload with some inputs on, with some hardware um, allocation on a certain workload, or, sorry, on a certain program. So we are going to 
um, planning to help with our, our, our users with that data, like on average, uh, how much you should set uh, as, a, as a running time, for example. Those could be in the cards. How do yeah. I know that, sorry, okay. Okay. how do I know that the prover is running the full uh, specification you promised me? How do you know? Yeah, for example, the, the disk, there are like 192 gigabytes available during the run. Uh -huh. the, the thing is, it's I think it's more tied to the proving time because if you set your proving time in relation to the resources allocated and the prover will not uh, like won't allocate that many resources then in 5 minutes they wouldn't be able to pull off this this proof for you and we would kick them out because they failed to deliver a proof for you and slash that like you know it's it's kind of that's why it's important you would know your resource allocation and the proving time based on that resource allocation and with that if that's properly set our provers wouldn't be able to trick you really because if they allocate if they if, if they allocate half of it then five minutes won't be enough and they just fail to deliver a proof and they risk to be kicked out to be punished etc etc or even worse, you say it just get paid for the work. Right? I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean that's, th that's the least. Why the bench work about five minutes before submitting? Something like that. Pardon? It's like I have to certify that my benchmark before submitting to approval. If there is one sheet approver in the network, and when it will be permissionless, that starts behaving, okay, this proof I will just do nothing or claim that it took like eight minutes instead of five. How can I claim, yeah, but you should have taken five minutes, not eight? No, but they cannot deliver you a proof in eight minutes. Like the, the prover, like running the program stops at five. If they are not able to deliver a proof, then they, they will be punished. Like the protocol will take care of that. The fallback mechanism kicks in. New prover selected randomly. They will work on the proof and get you the proof done in five minutes and, and uh, uh, with the proper allocation. If the sec it's an interesting question. If the second prover also fails to deliver the job... Yeah, yeah they should complain about me. That's then, I'm yeah, saying. actually, That's then... Not, so I need a certification about my... Then they may... They, then the prover program may actually be uh, malicious. So, like, if the first prover fails, the second one succeeds. We know it was the prover's failure. If all provers we allocate there fail, then there may be an issue with the program itself. Uh, but it, it's a good point. I'll take note of that because that may be a valid it's request slash, from users of the network. Slash, no, let's say, but because I cheated as a user. Yeah, I mean, uh, in that case, like exactly because of that, it's a very sensitive area for us how we punish the nodes. Yeah. Yeah. Because there is a very fine line whether our nodes are not delivering, or whether it's you who have deployed a, a, a malicious prover program onto the network. And then we would, uh, I mean, in those cases, we may even block certain programs from, from the network. But anyway, I don't want to go into those, uh, those details either. With the, this price, this, this fee, this price function is static then? Um, yeah, it's USD based. Yeah, like we, so we are de denominating it in USD, but you will pay probably in the token of the of the platform. But you pay like how much it translates to. Yeah. In. What what kilowatt rate did you use to calculate this? Because the on the last side that hardware requirement looked like it was above. Oh, sorry. The actual like kilowatt price. Well, I think that that's something I, I, I won't be able to tell you by heart now. Yeah, it's like I mean, it's, what, what yeah, it's a, it's a, mu it's a much more, like that, it's, yeah, like that it's a much more complex uh, thing because, okay, so there are, that yeah, yeah, but I, I, know, I, I know mean, you talked about this, and I think what he did is he took the average of the more common areas you could run a data center, yes. yeah, not yeah, like but, the, like in Seamless China, sure, hydro yeah. plant ones. Yeah, but it's not. Uh, yeah, it's not super accurate, obviously, but it's. No, but I, I think what you are pointing to is like this is not going to. If you are a, a node operator, this is not going to be your income. That's the user fee. And we are going to have network subsidy to make sure that, you know, there are two things yeah. we want cheap proofs for the user yeah. and profitable operation for the node operator. Yeah. 
and the gap has to be bridged somewhere. There are different elements that can aid in this, like network subsidy will be one, but as soon as we reach economies of scale with proper ex uh, like orchestration and hardware utilization, and even like aggregating workloads and bringing network utilization to 85, 90% and like constant operation there, we basically start getting to a level where the economies of scale, the aggregation, the high network utilization, the proper workload orchestration so that we maximize the use of the, of the individual nodes as well. Uh, the network subsidy may be just one of the elements and not the dominant element for you to become uh, yeah, exactly. profitable. A data center where power is really expensive, you probably should be in another line of work. Yeah, but it's a... Yeah, as a distance by set of servers, they're going to be operating across the globe in a lot of different yeah. regions and have different hardware costs, have different power costs, and then yeah. they don't have any ability to influence the price function, then you're just pushing all into one optimal level. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that's, that is true. Which then, you have, then you actually have geogra geographic centralization, which like a geographic risk of like, you know, one, one yeah. volcano and you're, you're gone. Yeah, it doesn't matter but if it's, it's a, a good point. Yeah, they, like, well, the economics push them into one physical civilization. Yeah. That's fascinating. But, yeah. but actually that's a very good uh, point because it just reminds me, if any prover node wants to rent a server on AWS and run it as a prover node on Gavilot, they will never be profitable. Because on top of this price, whatever is added, it's not going to be enough to cover those, I don't know, server, yeah, server costs. Yeah, like the G6X anyway, just to watch you do it for Yeah. <laughs> but we're, we're using uh, the, uh, the 180 core 786 gig GCP instances yeah. to do some uh, polygon testing. And they're what, they're like 1800 bucks a month. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, <laughs> even no, more. They, or even more. Or even more, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so if, if anyone um, would like to run a prover node, these are a little bit more detailed specs of, of the GPU and CPU node. It's an incentivized network. We are onboarding prover nodes even now. Um, and there is actually a, a QR yeah, code on the yeah, next. Massively stupid question. No, 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 go for Let's it. Imagine that I'm playing the cyberpunk, whatever, with my you know, the GPU, right? <laughs> Do I get like, a notification uh, when you should stop and do this proving and then you can? No, I mean, we expect... We're setting up and never meet the minimum requirements. Ah, uh, because it's... Uh, you're, yeah. you're, unless you're running like a... Let me see. Uh, yeah. like a a thread ripper or something, you're not getting the 64. Yeah. Right? And actually, right? you wouldn't remain in the network too long because, as I mentioned, like, we are going to, not just initially, but randomly, periodically, okay. later on as well, send test workloads, you need to be available and be well, able to, yeah. like, so no uh, within a two, three second uh, time, you need to explicitly accept the job that okay. has been allocated to you. If you don't accept it, we treat it, okay, you are unavailable for that. I mean, there could be consequences for unavailability, that's one thing. But right away, without even the fallback mechanism kicking in, if you don't explicitly accept it, we're going to allocate it to another node. Uh, etc. So there are those mechanisms ingrained to make sure that uh, like ad hoc prover node failure that could any time happen. They are just have some constraint at their end, they are just not available. Um, so we, we take care of the reallocation um, right away. Yeah, and um, we also have uh, some size of our own cluster. You can uh, rent a prover node from us as well. It's not going to be a huge cluster, like a dominant sized cluster of the network, obviously, because we want to uh, build a decentralized network. But if you want to run a, a prover node, get the, the incentives that comes with it, uh, and rent a server for, for that, you can even rent from us. You can scan the QR and there is a, a form uh, where you can see a bit more details. Um, all nodes, whether you run your own hardware, uh, or you you use uh, or you rent from us. That's gonna be uh, those are going to be receiving the same prover rewards. And maybe as a summary, yeah, maybe I should have um, planned it this way. As a quick summary, how a life cycle of a proving workload looks. <clears throat> I'd say, um, okay, so you have your program deployed. Let's finish off with this one. The user sends a run transaction. 
that lands with a validator, it sends the transaction to the mempool, it's going to be included by the, by the leader in the next block, then assigned to uh, a prover node, the prover node delivers the proof, at that point already the user can fetch it and use it for settlement and verification uh, elsewhere. And then um, the proving result is going to be available for verification in the mempool. So the randomly selected subset of prover nodes will pick up the job, vote for the validity of the proof. As soon as all the votes are in, um, the verification results again land in the mempool, land in a block. As soon as it's finalized, we are distributing rewards. And if you want to fetch the proof only at this point in time, then, then that's where the proof um, would be shared with you. Yes, so... Uh, and you get charged by exactly the timing uh, yeah, so or, or, or just the, the, the actual running time based the, on the resources? The timing maximum, uh, that's, that's what it would be. So for example, for this one, 32 cores, 190 gigs, one GPU and running for five minutes, that would be 3.5 cents even for you. Even though the, 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 the proof would take uh, four minutes? Yeah, I mean, the there gets the full... The yeah, yeah, full yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Or, for example, a CPU workload, like for the Polygon ZKVM, you would need the entire capacity of this node. So that's an example for that, basically. 96 cores, 760 gigs of RAM, but only running for 10 minutes. Then you would pay one-sixth of the hourly cost, like 10 cents. Yeah, it's like you are abstracting yeah. from the underlying yeah. job. Literally, you are paying for yeah. the resources and then, and the time. The most interesting thing is, is that one thing is that the cost, the workload fees are, are low. On the other hand, we remove your being responsible for the idle time and you're paying for the idle time when you rent your own yeah. server, for example. Then you, you pay a whole lot for the idle time. And uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's a meme that uh, our CEO Temo posted yesterday, so I thought, let me put this in here. Firestarter is coming in a couple of days. Finally, uh, it's there. We've been expanding the scope as we were developing it, so it took a bit more time than we initially anticipated. But ZK is going to be dirt cheap soon. Uh, learn more at Gavulot, and we are happy to connect in case you need uh, cheap proofs, you want to do benchmarking on the network, or you want to run a prover node, whatever. Or you just want to merge it down relative. Okay. Please. So I have a question regarding the so are you passing the prover to the actual prover node? Pardon? So when you have to compute the proof, you know usually you can also pass some inputs and this input is usually private. And in a permissionless scenario, currently, how can it trust currently we do validity proving. So there but is ZK. Do the witness to be public or to be known? Like, we don't have privacy at the moment. With our custom prover sets, you are going to be able to set up, uh, for example, plug-in TEs and do your proving in a trusted execution environment. So the custom prover sets will enable you to do that as well. But currently, on Firestarter and the first version of ZK Cloud, that's going to produce you validity proofs. It's a very good point and thanks for, for asking that. So it's not a privacy protocol we are building. So if I want it's to generate a, as a knowledge proof that I know the private key to a certain address, I need to reveal the private key to the Oh, no, 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 wait a second. <laughs> I think uh, we are like, let's say you want a proof to be generated for ZK Sync, for, for a block on ZK Sync. Or my custom proof. Yeah, that's, or your, your custom prover. So the, you don't need privacy per se, but your, your private keys are not going to be revealed. Oh, one minute. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Thanks a lot. How you can generate the proof then? You don't generate it's ZK proofs. You generate succinct proofs. So you generate, yeah. Okay. I have one question. Please. What about we, but we can take it offline and okay. come back to that. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I was pointing to you. Sorry. Go for it. Go for what it. about very large movements? Do I have to send them into your blogs? No, it's not going. It's not going to be included in the block per se. But it's it has to be available on a on a public address from where our prover nodes selected 
will download the input. Yeah. So it's not, yeah, it's not going to be baked into the bomb. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Thank Thanks for coming.